book, but we don't believe that Matthew chapter 24 is for the church. We glean some truth from it, but it's God turning back to dealing on a national scope of the nation of Israel. We're at verse number 40 in Matthew chapter number 24. Verse number 40 says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now we grabbed some context from Noah and Lot last week, and we, we've covered so much ground that we can't go back or we'll just we'll never get through new material. But when we as Christians get raptured, we are taken in glory to go be with the Lord. If it were to happen right now, we'd be taken up. We'd have a glorified body. In Noah's day, who was taken? The unbelievers were taken, and they weren't taken in glory. They were taken by God's judgment. Who was left behind? That would be Noah and his wife and his family. The believers, those that believed God, Noah, the righteous preacher and his family, were those that were left behind and protected and were able to move through all that flood and come out alive. So in Matthew chapter 24, when people try to apply it to the church, it doesn't really fit because Noah is the example. Lot was the example. We get taken in glory. We're not left behind. When God starts dealing with this prophetic week, Daniel's 70th week, the unbelievers are taken, and they're taken in judgment. The believers are left behind, and they're allowed to survive, and then they enter into the millennial kingdom. Christ comes back at his second coming and sets that up. So with the context from Noah and Lot, we need to be consistent. Here in these verses, we're not talking rapture stuff. Those that are left are those that are protected on the earth. So verse number 40, two are in the field. One is taken in judgment, the other left. They're preserved, they're protected. Verse number 41, two women. One is taken. I'm adding in judgment, but that's the context. And the other left, left behind to be able to survive. Those that are left are protected on the earth. Those that are taken, judgment falls upon them. Now, to get Luke chapter 17, we're going to show one more example, and then we're going to take a little side trail, a rabbit trail that'll be kind of fun. Luke chapter 17 and verse number 34. Luke 17, verse number 34. Four. The Bible says, I tell you, it's a cross reference to Matthew 24. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. That's the side trail we're going to take, by the way. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. One shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, if you go back and search the sermons, we did a whole thing on the eagles, and we, we, we exhausted that as best I know how. So we're not going to review. We're just going to move forward. But two men in one bed, I have to say this because you have to say this in nowadays, and you can't say it enough. This is not giving a pass for sodomy. A matter of fact, there's nothing perverted going on here at all, but at, but our minds, because it's been so soaked in the sin of this culture, and we have been so ingrained in wickedness that goes on on the earth, when we read something like that, our minds and our brains automatically go to, well, that's, no, it's not that. It isn't. Our assumptions when we read the Bible, cannot be trusted. The Bible is trusted. Our assumptions that we bring to the Bible, that's all they are is assumptions. Our culture is wicked. 
every word of God is pure. This is why we want the Bible to be our final authority, not our assumptions or our opinions. I know it's hard to get that out because you've got assumptions and opinions and convictions and standards just like I do. We just not we just need to be careful that we don't add to the Bible. Most of our assumptions, especially when people read this and this perverted society that wants to read this and say, no, we're Christians and we're living the alternative lifestyle. No, it's a it's a sinful lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of sodomy where God condemns that. But the assumptions that people take when they read a passage like this comes from our twisted and confused culture that influences their mind. In case, well, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 1. Who was it that said, believe but verify? Was it Reagan? I think he said that. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> so we're going to, don't just believe what I say out of one verse. Let's, let's verify some of this by running some cross references. In 1 Kings chapter 1, look at this. Chapter number 1, verses 1 through 4. Now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. Wherefore his servants said unto him, Let there be salt for my lord the king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get heat. So they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coast of Israel, and found Abishag, a Shumanite, and brought her to the king, and the damsel was very fair, period. Now, if the Bible just ended there, we could let our minds run and create assumptions that aren't there. But it doesn't stop there, because there isn't a period. There's a comma, and it says, and cherish the king and minister to him, but the king knew her not. So what's this idea of two men in a bed? What's this idea here of David? First off, look at verse number one. Is this young David or old David? This is old David. Is this ready to fight good health David or is this worn David? It's worn. It says he's stricken. This is worn out old David. What was David's problem? He was, he was cold. David was cold. I'll tell you, we had this once, once in a 10-year ice storm, they say. I don't know if they say that to make you feel good about going into the next winter. But this ice storm that hit this last winter in Middle Tennessee, we were out for four nights. I thought we had a bad. I talked to Sister Myra. Oh, no. Brother Jimmy, we were, we're still out. You know what we did? We went downstairs and we had two in one bed. <laughs> Me with one kid, Cheyenne with another kid. Why? We needed some heat. We needed to stay warm. That's what this is about. Why are two men in a bed? You try living in Palestine in the middle of winter without central heat. <laughs> you try fighting all day, doing battle all day, farming all day, and then going to sleep. At night, in the middle of winter in Palestine, what are you going to do? Get in bed with me. Let's find a way to stay warm. <laughs> that's what that's about. It's got nothing to do with where people take their minds. Notice what else we see in First Kings. What did David do here? David really didn't do anything. David's servants did. Let's help. David out and the servants took charge and they did something because they saw that David was just old and cold and they wanted to help him out. Abishag, what did she do? Well, she cherished the king. When you look up the word cherish, part of the definition is to give warmth to ease and to comfort. That's what that was about. Ministered to him. Gave him relief. 
or give somebody relief when they're sick. That's called ministering to somebody. Go back to Matthew 24 and uh, actually slip, slip over to chapter 25, if you would. Look at Matthew 25. Look at verse 44. We're talking about ministering to somebody. That's what this was about. Look at verse 44 in chapter 25 of Matthew. Then shall they also answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger or thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? And you're going to see David's old. Worn out, stricken in years, you get somebody that's needs some ministering to, you're gonna do what you can to help them out. So that's that's about. I'd like to show you something else if you wouldn't mind going to Ecclesiastes chapter number four, um, Proverbs, and then you'll come to the book of Ecclesiastes. I'll show you another verse, Ecclesiastes chapter number four. Maybe you've not studied the book of Ecclesiastes in a while, but I think everybody uh, most Christians understand it's a book that basically exposes, especially this chapter, the problems of vanity. Everything this life's this world's vanity. And look at what it says in Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 11. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Meaning, well, first we see why are, why would two lie together? Why would two men be in a bed together? To be warm, to get some heat, it's cold. It's just that we read the Bible as American Christians, and we think everybody should have central eats, central air, indoor plumbing, air conditioner in their car, two cars, <laughs> a dog, a cat, and, you know, a, a vacation every Nine months, and we're just Americans. When God turns back and deals with the nation and the Christian remnants called out, you want to talk about a hot mess? You got yourself one. They're going to do anything they can do to survive. It's completely foreign to you and to me to think that we would need to be in a bed with somebody else until you take one of these military tours and you go down to the submarine and you see how they got five, six, seven, eight beds packed in one little room and area. Try that. You can't hardly breathe when you go through the submarine and the, and the ships because it's so hot. Yeah, there they were down there. Our military men and women packed in there. So, but Ecclesiastes, uh, it's, draw that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse number 11. How can one be warm alone? In other words, you and I have all this stuff, yet we have no companionship. You got nobody to get heat from, you got nobody. But you got stuck. That's the whole idea of the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, vanity. Just life's vanity. None of this stuff lasts. Car don't last. House don't last. Money don't last. It don't last. Which is why we are not trying to sell somebody on a self-help personal development course to get them wealth, health, money, and social status. We're trying to give them living water. We're trying to give them eternal life. People say, I got a life. I don't need that. How about eternal life? Yeah, you might have a life now. Watch this one. Uh, well, two more. Exodus chapter number 22. Exodus 22. Spending a bit of time here because I don't want anybody to think that there's anything 
perverted going on in Matthew 24, or in Luke 17, rather, when it talks about two men in one bed. So look at Exodus chapter 22 for another proof text. And let's look at verse number 25. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer. Thou shalt, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. Verse 26, if thou all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. This is completely foreign to me. I would submit that it's probably completely foreign to you. If I were to ask you as a parent to do this for your children, throw out every single coat that they have for winter, except one, and get rid of all of their bedding. They have no blanket to cover themselves up with at night. If I were to present that to you and ask you to do that as a parent, you would think that I've lost my mind. Maybe Seth, you can try that tonight, or Isaiah, you can try that as a test, see who lasts the longest. Well, maybe in the wintertime you can have that contest. You know what's going on here? If you took a man's coat back then, that's what he used as his blanket. But you and I can go down to Walmart. We can buy two coats, five blankets. And if we're too cold, we can go back to Walmart the next night and get some more blankets. Not so here. You know what God said? You take a man's coat, you better have, you better give it back to him at night. So he's got a covering because he uses his winter coat. He uses that outer garment. Also as a blanket. As bad as it is here, based on tracking our nation's history from 1920 to now, imagine being an Afghan woman right now. Imagine living in North Korea right now. It's bad. Imagine it's the middle of winter. You have no indoor heat. You don't have blankets. You have one coat. And when the sun goes down, it's not, Mom, can you go get me my blanket? I'm cold. It's, Mom, can you go get me my winter coat? I need something to cover me. I'm cold. But we have such abundance. We're so used to being, I hate to say it, and I don't, I don't mean we, like the people in this room. I just mean we as a nation are so used to being spoiled Americans. We can have what we want, when we want it, how we want it. If we don't like it, we can, we can find somebody else to fix it within a week. But you're in a position now where there's no fixing it. You got one coat. Any parents want to try that this one? Your family would think that you're a crazy parent. Yet back then, that was life. That was life. So we can praise God that we have abundance. Let's just not take for granted what God has given us. All right. How about the book of Isaiah? Let's go there. Yeah, let's do that. Song of Solomon, and then Isaiah, and we'll get the 28th chapter. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Isaiah chapter 28, I'd like you to pay attention to this. It seems simple, it is. Watch this, Isaiah chapter 28, look at verse number 20. The Bible says, for the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. Anywhere you go to find comfort, you can't. You try to lie in your bed, you can't stretch out your legs, the bed's not long enough. You can't get comfortable in your own bed. You try to cover yourself. The blanket's too narrow, you can't have enough to cover yourself to get warm. And you're not going to find it. 
And that is likened unto salvation. People. Look for ways to fill their comfort. They look for ways to cover their sin. And they look for ways to cover their iniquity. But instead of security, they find restlessness. They can't sleep. Instead of your bed associating with a sense of restlessness, it's associated now with a sense of distress and anguish. You've got nothing to protect you from the chills of the night. And I'm telling you, there are people, which is why we're trying to bring the gospel to the lost. There are people that spend their lives seeking protection from idols, from religion, from false self-help uh, prophets, from the government, from fill in the blank. They spend their whole life. trying to cover their sin with something that will only cause them restlessness. They can't stretch out in the bed. They got enough covering and they don't have enough covering to cover their sin and their iniquity. And there's going to come a day where God's going to bring down his hand of judgment. And young people pay attention. When you come to an age where you understand right and wrong, good and evil, sin, God's going to hold you accountable. I don't know what age that is for you. When you get to that age and you leave this world without Jesus Christ, young people, middle-aged people, old people, people that think they have all the answers, people that think they have all the covering set up, when God's wrath comes upon you because you don't have enough covering for your sin, you can show them all the good work blankets you want. You can show them all the religious blankets that you want. You can try to get as comfortable as you want in your bed of idols and your bed of religion. But God is going to bring down his wrath upon you if you have not found covering for your sin. And the only person that can cover your sin is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Young people and old people pay attention equally. Life is not a game. For you to be amused through. Life is short and should not be taken for granted. There is a very high likelihood that none of you will be on a ventilator tonight at 1 a.m. Like my friend John is. But if you were. And your life was about to get snuffed out. In any other way. You've got to know. That Jesus Christ is the only covering. For your sin. And if you don't trust. In what he did for you. And you trust in your own works. Religion. Social status. Or family lineage. It is not enough to cover you. It's too narrow of a blanket. It's too short of a bed. And you will always be restless. And when God's wrath comes upon you and you die without Jesus Christ and his judgment comes upon you, there's no turning back. There's no, well, I want to repent too late. And what's the one thing that none of us can do when we get to heaven, if we're saved and Christians, is witness to the loss. That's why there's an emphasis. That's why there's a draw and a pull and a push and an urging to get the glorious saving gospel of Jesus Christ out to this lost and dying world. Because when the day comes when someone passes from this world into eternity, that's it. There's no going back and talking to grandma. There's no going back and talking to pass. There's no going back and talking to uncle or auntie. Or brother or sister, or son or daughter, or friend or neighbor, or co worker. That's it. What's covering your sin? Hope it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't hide yourself in a bed of lies. And the best thing you can do 
is probably the best thing that a lot of Afghan men and women can do right now is get saved. They'll never have enough bed to sleep on. And they'll never have as many blankets and winter coats that you and I have. They will always struggle to stay warm on a cold dirt floor. Missionaries will always be in tears when they go to a foreign land and they have food and they bring it out. And all the village kids run and they have to take off because there's going to be a big fight over food if they... Because you and I have an abundance of food in our refrigerator. And the best those people can do is get saved. Because when they die, oh, they've got plenty of covering. Oh, they've got plenty of bed to be restful in. Because they'll be safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. This world might not offer the best opportunity to people like you and I have. But our gospel offers the same opportunity. It doesn't matter who you are. That's why we preach the gospel. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Jesus Christ. So why are two men in the bed during Daniel's 70th week? To provide each other heat. So we all do well to understand the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And an everlasting king. It's been said, let God be true, the Bible says, and every man a liar. So there's nothing at all going on perverted with two men in a bed. I think we got that down. We got that down? Amen. If you, amen. Okay. All right. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Let's change gears and we'll start to wind down. Matthew 24. Look at verse 42. You haven't gotten all the messages from verse 1 all the way up to verse 42. We've been spending a goodly amount of time on it. Uh, so it's hard to qualify everything. But the command and the warning that God gives the Jews is this in verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Look at verse, uh, let's get Luke as well. I should have had you turn there earlier. But look at Luke 21. We'll finish this thought with the watchfulness. We'll pick up with this next week. But in Luke chapter 21, it's the cross reference. We'll go back to verse number 34. Luke 21, 34. And take heed to yourselves. God gives three commands here. Take heed is one. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. You know what that is? Gluttony. It's excessively stuffing yourself. We just got some pigs that we put on our property. And pigs are known for stuffing themselves. You have scraps, you throw them to the pigs. They'll eat anything. That's, you don't want to be a glutton. You don't want to be surfeiting and just continuing eating where you just stuff yourself and you're going to pop like a balloon. That's not a Christian thing to do. You should be, you should be in control, not having food control you. But that's what that is. It's just glut. It's the sin of gluttony and drunkenness. We know that's a sin and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unaware. So you have to take heed because people really don't care what's going on around them. They're going to eat, they're going to drink, they're going to get drunk, they're going to be married. They don't care. They're not going to think about salvation. Cares of this life. Uh, look at verse 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray. That's the second admonition. Take heed. Number two is watch. And then the third is to pray always. That you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. Now, I'm just going to say quickly, 
go back, you get all the context of all this. But Daniel 70th week, the salvation that's being referred to is a physical salvation. Those that don't take the mark, those who obey what the Lord told them to do, they're going to flee the mountains, they're going to do all this stuff. They're going to do what the Lord told them to do, and they're going to live physically. And their salvation is going to be a physical salvation. It's why the Lord shortens the days. If he shortens the days, it makes sense if it's physical salvation. We want more people to live to get where they need to go. Well, we don't want the days shortened now because we're talking about a spiritual salvation. If anything, we want longer days. Give me another hour to witness to somebody so we can get another soul. Well, we're not going to get the soul saved. We're going to pray that the Lord would use us to bring his message so the Holy Spirit would convict their heart. And we can just praise God that we were a vessel that he used. But we want longer days so we can witness to more people. So it's a physical salvation. And the Jews are admonished to watch. Ever people watch? It's amazing what people are into. It's amazing how they'll just go right back, a gospel preacher or a public, someone doing public evangelism. They'll go right past them. So many times we've stand outside of sporting events. Uh, downtown where the bars are, you go down to Hell's Corner on the west side. So many people, all the bars are right there. And they just don't care. They don't care. They're too busy living their life. But the Jews are admonished during Daniel's 70th week to watch. Watch the events unfold. Watch the unbelieving nation. Watch those unbelieving Jews. Just watch it all. And then pray. All of us need to take this to a personal application. Isn't it great to witness for Jesus? Isn't it great to live for Jesus? You remember when you were lost and you were living in the world and don't think too long because none of us want to go back there. And, oh, now we get to live for Jesus. It's so much better. My mind is sober. <laughs> my, my, my thoughts are sober. The things that I'm doing now are, are have eternal value. Praise the Lord. We get to go out and give gospel tracts. We get to get together and, and have church. We get to get together and have food and we fellowship and we talk and we do all that. Except we can't forget to seek the Lord in prayer. It's so easy to get into this lifestyle of, well, do you see what I'm doing for the Lord? Well, do you see what our church is doing for the Lord? Do you see how active we are? Now, should we be active? Sure. Should we witness to the lost? Sure. Do I want to do more and do I want you to do more for the Lord? You bet. But not at the expense of a proud, haughty spirit that forgets to seek the Lord in prayer. So we all can take heed, watch, but we can't forget to pray. And the believing Jews are told to pray that they are left behind because they will enter into the millennial kingdom and they will stand before what does it say we'll finish with this no i gave you a lot tonight and to stand before the son of man finally the last cross reference and then we will be done is mark 13 33 it says take ye heed watch and pray for ye know not when the time is so Matthew 24 Luke 21 and Matthew and Mark 13 all tie together as cross references mm -hmm.